Welcome back to the Felix Factor for another great session in biology. We've got a great show on tap today. Uh, according to the producers, we're going to be talking about respiration. So to kick off today's show, I thought we would uh, welcome our newest unofficial sponsor, Psycho Coconut Water. But back to bio. So to begin, we're going to talk about, you know, the opening essay. Um, so I'm supposed to tell you about how geese had the competitive advantage over this guy when it comes to breathing in thin altitudes. So as you know, your your blood has something called hemoglobin, which is an iron protein which helps hold on to your oxygen when it's carried around through your circulatory system. Well, geese, first of all, have a very high affinity in their hemoglobin for oxygen. Second of all, their lungs can take in much higher quantities of oxygen than my lungs can. So, it's not really fair, you know? Humans have, a, you know, some humans that live very high in the mountains, they evolve by getting, or not evolve, but like they adapt by having, I guess you call it evolution, they have larger hearts, you know, more larger lungs, more more aff affinitive hemoglobin, similar things that geese do, but it's, it's, it's harder because... Geese are, 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 you know, like, that's one of their main adaptations, whereas humans are not meant, or are, don't usually live up so high in the mountains, so we're not built for that. So now we're going to move to the three stages of gas transport in the human body, this guy. First, we got inspiration and expiration, taking in air into the lungs. Now, in class, we discussed inspiration as being only taking gas into the lungs and then taking gas out of your lungs. There is no nothing about the uh, exchange. However, in the textbook, it it says, I quote, gas is exposed to uh, a large moist internal surface, and oxygen diffuses across cells into the lungs, and at the same time, CO2 diffuses out of the blood and into the lungs. Now that is called ex exchange of gases and diffusion, so whatever, I, I will leave it at that, but needless to say, that is what uh, the first stage of gas exchange is. Then we go to the transportation stage, uh, which with, using your circulatory system, your oxygen in your blood is transported to cells, which use it to perform cellular respiration and get ATP, and also your carbon dioxide comes back into your blood and gets transported back up to your lungs, waiting to get uh, diffused back into your lungs and expirated. And then lastly, we have the uh, exchange portion. This is really where the oxygen and the carbon dioxide uh, pass between the cells based on the, uh, the gradient of oxygen and stuff in the cells. And then, yeah, that's how it is. So I am aware that human beings tend to confuse respiration, which is taking air into the lungs, and cellular respiration, which is converting oxygen and glucose to ATP and carbon dioxide, and a bunch of other things as well. But, no son las la misma cosa. Don't get confused. So, there are four types of respiratory surfaces that we like to, uh, you know, deal with in this biosphere that we have here. But there are couple important characteristics before we get into those. First of all, all respiratory source surface has to be moist so that the gas can diffuse. Because if it's not moist, then, you know, doesn't really, gradient doesn't really work. You, you have to have a, a fluid in which it can dissolve for there to be diffusion. And also, it has to be very, very branched or a lot of surface area, so lots of gas can diffuse at, at once. And um, also, there, there has to be some other unit underneath for the for the gas to go into the capillaries, which is in most cases the case. So first of all, we got lungs like in this guy here. They are got two sacs, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, tiny little sacs underneath which are little capillaries into which the blood, uh, the oxygen can diffuse, carbon dioxide can diffuse out of. Uh, also got mucus on there, so stuff can. Diffusion can happen, you know, the works. Next we have gills, which you find in this guy, fish, and other aquatic creatures. Um, as you can see here, there are little, uh, little, uh, you know, things. 
through which so oxygen goes into or water goes into the mouth, goes to the side, and then gets absorbed by the gills there. Uh, doesn't need to worry about being moist because obviously fish live in water. That's why gills are optimal. Next, we have the tracheal uh, system, which consists of the uh, branched little pockets for when which air goes. Uh, these are useful because you don't actually need a circulatory system. The trachea can just visit the individual cells and oxygen can diffuse like you do. Lastly, we have the body surface and things like the earthworm, other like frogs. You got oxygen actually coming in through the skin of the animal, which is pretty neat because you don't actually need any respiratory system at all other than your skin. It's pretty useful. So now I'm going to talk a little more in depth about the gills, which of course are the gas exchange uh, organs in things like fish. So, first how this works. You have water coming in through the mouth, out through the gills in the side. This fish doesn't have gills that you can see, but in a real fish there would be gills right around here. The water exits through them. What happens is you have you have water, in it is oxygen. The problem with water is that there is not a lot of oxygen in water, which means that fish have to work especially hard, or gillid creatures, to uh, ventilate their lungs. And ventilation is just uh, getting, you know, substance through there. Um, for, so, uh, first thing it's important to know is that gills are constructed um, by little filaments, um, and then on each filament are little things called lamella. And then, so on those lamella, there are these little plates. And on the plates, you have cap you have capillaries running from the deoxygenated side to the oxygenated side. Obviously, you have um, arteries and veins going each way and stuff. But um, it goes up, across, and then through. So what happens is as you get the water coming across, at the same time, you got wa you got water coming the other way. So you got blood this way, water this way. The cool thing about this is something called countercurrent exchange. So on this one side, oxygen poor. This side, oxygen rich. This starts so w when you get blood on the on the all the way on the oxygen rich side, it's got a pretty much lot of oxygen in it already. But this water stock full of oxygen. So there's still a diffusion gradient between this blood and this water. Further along, this blood has already gained a fair amount of oxygen. This water has already lost a little bit, but there's still more water in here that can diffuse, more gradient. Here, very beginning, no oxygen in this, in this blood, very little in this water. Still, there's more in here than there is here, so more, more gradient. By that, this countercurrent exchange means that there can be a gradient throughout the whole process of uh, blood diffusing across, uh, of oxygen diffusing across that blood thing, which is super efficient for fish that, uh, no pun intended, very helps them out. So it's a very nice thing for them. And uh, another thing that they, they have is they have these, uh, the operculum, the, that little shell that covers the gills to make sure that nothing, you know, hurts there. But that's a, ma that's a basic gist. Needless to say, the human lungs are pretty complicated things. So to start off, let's start at the top. You have your nasal cavity as well as your oral cavity. Both of these work in inhaling air, but the nasal cavity filters and warms the air, unlike the oral cavity. Next, the air enters your pharynx, then it goes into your trachea, then it passes into your bronchi, which are two tubid things stretching in either side. Then, they move into the bronchioles, which are slightly smaller and more branched little tubes coming off of the bronchi. Next, air moves into the alveoli, which are little grape-like sacs at the end of the lungs. These are very small, and they, since they are moist, it sometimes can be a problem that they stick together. Therefore, humans secrete something called surfactants, which help keep the alveoli from closing on each other. Also, in the alveoli, it is possible that there could be little bacteria or viri. Therefore, there are things called macrophages, which help to make sure that the alveoli stay healthy and uninfected. Sometimes, breathing in pollution or tobacco smoke can cause some lung diseases, like 
COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. These can lead to shortness of breath be because of swelling of the bronchi, and you don't want this. Also, there are capillaries on the outside of the alveoli that help and contain the oxygen when it diffuses over and releases carbon dioxide when it diffuses back into the lungs. A lot of capillaries. Like a basketball court full. And to further understand better this whole breathing process in the, in the lungs of mammals and humans and such, we look at a soccer player named Sally, I think. Anyway, she had asthma, and which, which this means is that her bronchi become very inflamed, and also, um, and and this can restrict breathing. Also, uh, you can get mold spores growing in the bronchi, which can also restrict breathing. So there are lots of different ways that breathing can be restricted. None of these are good things. But uh, it's important to know, be conscientious, and you know, get a better understanding about your respiratory system. So you might be wondering, understandably, how this whole breathing process in our brain works out, and you know how, how that all happens. Well, here's the deal: start off with a, a resting heart rate, breathing rate, etc., which results in about 10 to 14 breaths per minute. Uh, now, what really happens here is that your brainstem sends a signal to your, your diaphragm and your rib muscles to expand and contract, relax, and, uh, and thereby um, making, more, um, making more oxygen into your blood and getting more carbon dioxide out of there. But what's interesting is that the reason that your breathing rate and heart rate uh, speed up when you are exercising is because you have negative feedback set up in your blood so that your body can sense if you have a lot of carbon dioxide in there because that makes your blood acidic. So what happens, your sensors in there say, mm, acidic blood, more oxygen, and then your brain sends a signal, and then, you know, start breathing faster, and it's all good. And the same thing happens when your, your blood becomes very basic, you say, oh, okay, I think we're breathing too fast, slow down a little bit, and then you do that, and so it works, believe it or not. So now that you have such a great understanding about all the different, you know, functions of your body, you know, blood passing through your, your body and all that stuff, you might be wondering what exactly happens in the diffusion and stuff. So there's something called partial pressure, which is basically just pressure and on a, 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 a diffusion gradient scale. And what I mean by this is if you have a lot of oxygen in your lungs, a lot, a lot of oxygen in the capillaries um, under your alveoli, there's a lot of, so there's a large partial pressure here, which makes... All that oxygen want to diffuse into those capillaries here, which means there's a, a partial pressure gradient, high here, low here. Same for carbon dioxide. Lots of carbon dioxide in your blood, not a lot in your lungs that way. So that's how it works. And uh, yeah. if you're looking for the chemistry section of Felix Factor, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for another year for me to take chemistry. But at the moment, we're going to talk about the chemistry of blood and hemoglobin. So you have... Each molecule of hemoglobin is consisted of four polypeptides. In the middle of each is one iron atom. Iron atom can hold one oxygen molecule per. So that's four polypeptides, four O2s per hemoglobin. Lots and lots of oxygen for each red blood cell. But here's, here's the more interesting part. So when the carbon dioxide mixes with the blood plasma, which is mostly water, I might add, um, you get carbon dioxide and water to react to form high excuse me, carbonic acid, which has a chemical formula H2CO3. See how the water and the carbon dioxide kind of bounce out there? Then um, then it, it, it combines again to get a hydrogen atom and a bicarbonate so that it's not so acidic. Then when it goes back to the lungs, it reverses, so it's, it's a reversible reaction. It's all good. It diffuses out of the lungs, and we have carbon dioxide for trees to eat. And that concludes this week's Felix Factor.